Hello, welcome or welcome back to my channel and welcome to another reading vlog where I'm gonna be reading The Fires of Vengeance. So The Fires of Vengeance is book two in the Burning series, which is a fantasy series. And I have read book one and I actually have also a video for it. So if you haven't watched that one, maybe watch it before watching this one. And I will link it in the description and also up there. And I mean, I absolutely love that book. And so I was super excited to get into this one. And I just want to say that there are spoilers for what happens in this book in this video. And having said that, let's just get into it. Okay, so I am on page 138 of Fires of Vengeance, and that is around 25%, I think. And also it's <laughs> chapter 4, because like I said in the first book, these books have like bigger chapters with smaller sections inside. And in this one, we start with Tao actually visiting one of his friends in the infirmary, because he got burnt by the dragon at the end of like the big fights in the first book and first of all like he was saying to his friend i mean he was kind of like in a coma i guess and he didn't even know that the friend if the friend was hearing him but he was saying I want you to know you did it. You're the man you always wanted to be. You don't need the blood of a greater noble to be an Ingonyama, which are like the strongest soldiers, I guess. Not when you have their spirit, their courage. And I was like, that is so cute. And then still like in the, like this was in the first section of the first chapter and still in here, like he's pretty much making a recap of what happened in the first book. So Maybe I'll do one too. So we, like the first book started with a prologue of a queen getting to a new place with her people because they were running from something that they call the call. And in book one, we got kind of an explanation what the, of what the call is, but I am honestly still kind of confused. And yeah, they got there. They had to fight with the natives to basically be able to stay there because she was just willing to do anything to protect her people. And then we move to 186, I think, years in the future, and we start following Tao. And in this society, there are two big groups. So we have the nobles and the lessers, and Tao is one of the lessers. And his dad is killed by some nobles. And so he is like on his revenge path to avenge his father's death. And the main step that he has to go through to get his revenge is to be part of the army and he manages to get there and then they are actually like the army of the lessers is competing with the army of the nobles and that's where he's gonna try to kill all the nobles and i mean he kills one and the other he kind of learns that you know he's actually a good person he just had to do what he had to do because he was you know being like controlled by the other guy and so they're there and then they are invaded by the natives. And then they learn that like that other noble, like the one in charge is like he attacked the natives when they were trying to make like a treaty for peace. And so then the natives obviously attacked back. And he also is trying to get the throne and like usurp the throne from the queen basically. And then like at the end of the book, we learned that that guy, he's called Odili, and he has actually the support of most of, like, the important people. So, you know, the queen has lost a lot of support, and she did make a deal with the warlord of the natives, but they only have, like, a month to figure their shit out. And so, you know, he's recapping all that. And then the last sentence of the first section of the first chapter is... 
Tao saying to like his friend that is in the infirmary. Keep fighting, and I swear that before it consumes us, we'll burn our pain to ash in the fires of vengeance. Which I love. And so basically now, both the queen and Tao, they have the same enemy, that guy called Odili. And here, like literally the first page of the book, I'm going to read it because, again, I love it. The queen's cause wasn't his. Tao was fighting to get to Abasi Odili so he could rip him apart, turn him inside out, piece by bloody piece because that was what it would take for the nobles to see and hear a man like him. To be understood, he speak the one language the powerful share with the powerless, the language of pain, fear and loss. The powerful had to be shown that people can only be pushed so close to the flame before they catch fire and burn everything down. Yeah. And so moving on from that, and also I forgot to mention that Tao has become like the champion of the queen. And so they're going to be working together, and also he's her champion. And we learned that the Queen's Council has actually been having meetings without her, and they are making decisions without her, and they want to basically surrender to Odili, which the Queen learns as well, and obviously she hates that idea. And they want to surrender because basically they have like the natives to fight in now less than a month, and they don't think they can win without Odili's people. But also they can't get to Odili with the natives still in their way. So they want to surrender, but the queen isn't having any of that. And the fight starts and they like get they manage to capture those traitors from the council. And then I don't know if it's like right after like the next day or a couple of days later, but basically like the main traitor like he escapes and then like there is an assassin and the assassin has a poisoned blade and he's fighting with Tao and I mean Tao does kill him but he gets like stabbed or slashed or whatever in his leg and so the sort of nurse who's there wants to amputate his leg because if he just doesn't do anything the poison will spread and it will kill him and the poison is dragon's blood by the way and Tao does not want to amputate his leg, which obviously is understandable, especially because he's a soldier, but also, like, it could kill him. And so he says that, you know, just make a cut, like, cut the whole poisoned part and just be done with it. And they say that, you know, the, the poison might have spread and it will still, like, make him, like, feel a lot of pain and it will be unbearable and all of that. But he's like, no, just do it, just cut that part off and let me go fight and like find the traitors and so they do that and they do find the traitors and they get them back and then after they get back Tao is attacked by a demon and I mean people can be attacked by the demons when they are sent to the underworld by the gifted but he's attacked by a demon like in the overworld his world so that was strange and I mean he manages to kill the demon but then he like turns to ash and disappears and then when he tells his friends they don't believe him they tell him that you know you've lost a lot of blood you're very tired you're just hallucinating stuff but surely that is a terrible sign that something wrong is happening and then he's like still talking to his friends who are also lesser like from his army group and he's talking about like how the nobles just think that they're so much better than the lessers. And I just I also like the fact that this book has so many green tabs already and green means anger. And that is literally every time that the nobles were assholes. I mean, not every time they were assholes, much more than this, but these were the ones that I wanted to just throw the book out of the window. Um, yeah, so Tao is talking to his friend and he's saying, the lie isn't that we can't be their equals. The lie is that they were ever anything but our equals. Yes, if the measure of a man was height, the nobles were taller. If the measure of a man was physical strength, then the nobles were stronger. But Tao knew who decided what needed to be measured and they'd chosen things in which they already had an advantage. They said, this matters more than that, making it seem as if their edicts sprang from natural law when they were little more than self-serving choices. They wore the rules in their favor, succeeded more often than others, and pointed to that as proof of their superiority. It was all a lie. Exactly. And then they make 
a plant that, like I said before, they can't like get to Odili with the natives there and they can't kill the natives without Odili's army. And so they make a deal that like when the natives are leaving that area, they will wait for when the warlord will, like he will be one of the last ones to board the ship, so they think, and they will wait until there is only like the last ship full of people, so the warlord and the rest of people who will go with him, and they will attack and they will kill the warlord, because, you know, without the warlord, they will be a little lost. And so they go on their way to the beach, and they were right, in fact, the warlord stayed for the last ship, and they start fighting with the warlord and his people, and Tao is obviously fighting, I mean, he's really fucked up, but he's fighting, and like, he was killing someone, and it said, his sword made the air sing before it smashed into her lead hand, splitting the limb in half and sending her spear flying away. Her cry then, as she fell, with her hand, wrist and arm in flaps, was a cry not of pain, but of despair and loss. It was a cry to match the things Tao felt before sleep saved him every night. It was the cry he held inside himself whenever he thought of everyone he'd lost. That was so sad. Like, that paragraph just broke my heart. I mean, this series is, like, constantly breaking my heart, but that was so fucking sad because it is right just because it's right. And yeah, basically the last thing I read was that battle and they do kill the warlord and yeah, that is where we are at. And so yeah, like I said, this series is, you know, once more absolutely destroying me. And again, this one has like this book, I'm getting more angry than sad, even though I'm still getting pretty sad. But like the first one was just just sadness. This one is sadness and anger. And I mean, is that better? I'm not sure. And yeah, I mean, I still absolutely love Tao and I am invested in his revenge plan. And I mean, I do love that he's the champion because even though he's still like getting shit from the nobles because they all fucking suck, at least like he has, he can order them around kind of. So you know, I'm enjoying that he has like some power over them, but you know, things are obviously not great yet, if they will ever be, I mean, you know. And yeah, once again, just like in the first book, we are already having so many fight scenes, which I love, and they're so good, and especially like this battle of the end of chapter three, absolutely iconic. And yeah, I mean, I am loving all the pain that I'm feeling with this book. And I am probably going to read a little more tonight. It's, I mean, it's 11.50. But yeah, I probably will read a little more tonight. And maybe I'll update when I'm like maybe halfway through. We'll see. So I am on page 326, which is like 60-ish percent into the book. And I think I said in the other update that they were, like they had just killed the warlord and there was like a fight. And one of Tao's friends slash sword brothers got like really badly injured. And so they were trying to save him and like transport him back to where he could be treated. And it was actually really nice to see that the lessers and the nobles were both working together to save that boy, who, by the way, was a lesser. And I mean, Tao also, like, noticed that, uh, you know, it was nice to see them all working together. And I mean, he also felt that he actually was, like, responsible for all of them since he's the queen's champion. And also, once again, he keeps saying that, you know, everyone he cares about either dies or gets badly injured. And he just, you know, his life continues to suck. 
and well when they get back that boy does get treated and I mean he won't be able to fight again but he does survive and the traitors from like I talked about in my first update are executed and then Tao is talking to the queen and she says something interesting because she says we want our people to have their proper place we want to undo the mistakes that were made and she's saying that the treatment that they have for the lessers and for the natives of that land it's not what their goddess wanted and they barely survive because they do not live as they were meant to and then she says the queens before us they didn't listen to their goddess and uh, well, like when she explained this i didn't really know what she was talking about but then she explains like this later but basically she wants her people to go back to the like the land that they came from before they invaded this land that they are now on and they also make a plan to finally go attack odili and tao tells the queen that he has been training in easy hogo which is the underworld and he has been fighting demons because he just wants to learn how to fight better how to kill better and what better way to learn than to try to kill unkillable beings and it's not like his body is there so like his body doesn't get physically stronger but he learns how to do it and he like i said his body is not there so he doesn't get actually physically harmed unless he tries to draw power from the underworld if he does or if anyone who's there draws power from the underworld they do get injured and so he tells that to the queen and basically says that he could be training other people to also practice killing the demons i mean not killing the demons fighting the demons to get better at fighting and that would give them a better chance of actually being able to fight odili and his people and the queen agrees and so he has to choose a group of people that he trusts people that after having all that power basically want to betray them and so he chooses his sword brothers and also kellen who is a noble but a noble that like the only noble that he trusts and they all go into the underworld and they're all fine like they do die in izihogo but when they come back they're fine all of them except for kellen he's like actually really badly hurt and immediately i thought is it because he's a noble because it's the only thing that he has different from the others and it turns out that it is. And so the queen then explains that the nobles are not basically the same kind of people. She says the same race of men. Like they're not the same race, apparently. They're not the same people. And before, like they were, because they are the Omehi people. And apparently the nobles were not part of the Omehi people before. And she explains, long before we sailed to these lands, there were nobles and there were Omehi, and these were two separate peoples. It is why the nobles are bigger and stronger than you, and everyone like you. It is their gift. Men of the noble race are all born gifted, and that gift is a permanent connection to Izihogo. From the day they're born until they die, a fraction of their soul exists in the underworld, drawing a small but steady stream of power from it. Which is why Kellen got hurt, because he was drawing power from Izihogo. And basically they can, they learn, like the Omehi learn that they can kind of mix their gifts because like the queen said, the gift of the nobles is that they're stronger, they're bigger, they do have a connection to Izihogo. And the Omehi, like some of the women are gifted and they their powers are also connected to Izihogo in a way. And one of the things that they learned that they could do was make the nobles like some of the fighters even stronger and they can make them like bigger and stronger and just like very very powerful and almost like unkillable undestroyable and that's and like they learn how to merge together basically and then some more bad things happen while they're training but i'm, I'm not gonna get into that because this whole book is i mean this whole series is just sad and bad things happening but I'm just gonna jump into the next history lesson that we have. And I mean, I'm just gonna read what I highlighted from the book because I would never be able to say it as well as it is written here. So basically it's talking about when they were running from the coal, like before they came into this new land, they were running from the coal 
and we we already I think I said that we already had to learn some about the call but basically the I mean Easy Hogo was created as a prison for someone named Ukufa I think and it was created by their goddess to imprison that person there. And the call, it says, they swore their souls to Ukufa, the insatiate, in exchange for a never-ending existence. The insatiate kept his part of the bargain, and it was time for the call to keep theirs. They attacked the Andola first. The Andola, a peaceful people with gifts ill-suited to death and its dealings, were conquered and the call became their masters. But our ancient enemies did not stop. And by the time the other races of men had accepted that the call never would, they were too few to stop them. The chosen, and the chosen are the Omehi. They say that they are the chosen of their goddess. The chosen were one of the last that the call attacked. They came to destroy the goddess's people, hoping to cast our gifts from the world so that they might free Yukufa unopposed. It should have been the end of us, but the goddess gave us her guardians, which are the dragons, and we gave the call dragon fire. We could not withstand the cause advance by ourselves, and there were few to whom we could turn. We turned to the nobles. So that is when their races emerged. We begged them to help us, and they refused. We told them that when the call were finished with us, they'd come for them. We said that together we could defeat the call, take all their lands, and the people they had conquered. Together, we said we could rule Osonte. They laughed. If you wanted Osonte, we, we would take it, they told us. And basically, they didn't want to just join them, but that is when they learned that they could use that gift that I said, they could enrage the nobles and make them even more powerful, stronger. And so basically the nobles agreed to join the Omehi and like fight with them as long as they were seen as better people. Because, I mean, they saw themselves as better and that is why they, the nobles are like the highest position in the like their social class. And yeah, that was their deal. And... The queen agreed because she was, you know, kind of desperate to save her people. And then they fought the call. And then even, even though they fought with the nobles, they, I mean, they could buy some more time, but they had to keep running. And that is why they ran to the land that they are now on. And then we have another history lesson. And this is the last one I'm going to be talking about because, I mean, it's the last one we have gotten so far. But the queen is talking about her sister, who's called Essie. And she is like lining up with Odili, she is there with him and like people want her to actually be the queen because they thought that the queens no longer had the gifts, like people thought that and Essie does not have a gift but the, the actual queen does have the gifts and she's saying, Princess Essie, we were born together, most can tell us apart, our bodies, our spirits, they were fashioned from the same instance of the goddess's will and our births are a sign because Essie is giftless. We were both tested by the Shadow Council, and when they believed Essie to be without gifts, she was tested over and over again. They had to be sure. They did what they needed to be done to be sure. And Essie is the goddess's warning that even in the Homehia line, gifts can thin, they can fade, and they will vanish. It has fallen to us to act. We must return the Chosen to their rightful place. If we don't do it, it will be too late. It is why we want peace on... I don't know how to say the name of it, but like the land they're on. The goddess didn't send us here to fight with the natives. She sent us here so that we could fight with them against the cult. The natives must be convinced that if the cult aren't stopped, they'll unleash Ukufa on the world. And when they do that, we will all die. And I said in my first update that Tao had seen a demon like in the overworld. I'm wondering if that is the beginning of like that, like Ukufa being released and the demons being released. And if so, that's is really not great. And the last thing that happened is that Tao showed the queen what he and his sword brothers can do in Izihogo in fighting the demons and she thought that they were actually pretty good and that they do have a chance to fight Odili because she does want to get sort of a deal with the natives to fight the call but first she has to deal with Odili and so they still need to do that and so they are sort of like ready to do that now and that is where I'm at basically and I am still really enjoying it and I feel like the main difference from this book to the first in terms of my enjoyment is that the first book like the beginning was like insane in like the best way and the ending was also super insane and intense and there in the middle, I was kind of, I wasn't bored, but I was a little tired of just 
the same thing, which was just them fighting and practicing. And so, well, it was like the beginning and the end were five stars and like the middle was maybe three. And I mean, I did give it four stars. And I feel like this one from the beginning to the 60% mark, which is where I'm on, is all like four stars, which again, I am really enjoying it. And I mean, the fact that this book is so violent, it has so many fight scenes and just horrible things happening to most of the characters. But at the same time, it has the most wholesome scenes ever, like especially among Tao and his sword brothers, like his friends. It's so fucking cute. And also, I mean, I love the discussions that they have in the about the societies and I especially when there are two people who have not exactly different opinions but like Tao just wants to you know kill everyone that not everyone that is a noble but like you know most nobles really fucking suck so he wants to get rid of them and someone else is saying that that is really that is not actually gonna fix what needs to be fixed and I understand both points of view and just yeah it's very interesting to see those discussions and I mean, I am loving to learn a lot more, especially in this last 30% or whatever that I read, we got to learn a lot about the these people's past. And I am really loving that. And I mean, just like the first book, it has a lot of action, a lot of fight scenes. And so it just feels very fast paced. And I am really enjoying that as well. And yeah, I am having a good, if sad time with this book. And I have like around 200-ish pages left, so I will probably update when I read a hundred of them and then again when I finish. So actually, I read a little more than 100 pages and I am on page 462 and I am like 85-ish percent in. And when Tao was killing the native's warlord, the warlord's son, who was like on a ship sailing away, actually saw it happen. And I mean, Tao made sure that he saw. And so the son, who's called Kana, he has gone to Tao's hometown and he is destroying it. And Tao and the others hear about it and they head there. And I mean, it's just absolute chaos, destruction and death. And, you know, as usual, fun things happening in the series. And actually Tao's sister and stepfather are dead and his mom is there, but she's like badly injured. And they do heal her like she's fine now but I mean I'll, honestly like I hate her so I wouldn't be mad if she wasn't fine because I mean she never cared about Tao ever but like now that she knows that he's the queen's champion like her son is so important she just wants to go with him and go with the queen basically and I just hate her so much but anyway, they are there and they are debating whether they should go after Kana because he's still like destroying other places. But then they learn that there is a general whose name I don't remember, but he has like the biggest army of their people. And so they need him to fight against Odili. And Odili also wants him to fight against the queen. So they both want him. And they learn that he's actually going to where Odili is. They just don't know exactly what the purpose is. And so they decide that they're going to head there, which is called Palm City. And they just need to get there before he does. And so while they're on their way, Tao actually sees another demon in the overworld. 
and he is wondering if it's the like the poison that they couldn't fully remove from him. He wonders if that's what's making him like hallucinate the demons, but then he realizes that other people see the demon as well, and they fight the demon and they manage to kill it. But the queen thinks that maybe it's the fact that they keep going to Izihogo and coming back and like fighting the demons and just basically calling the demons to them like when they're there. She's wondering if that's like what's causing a hole between the two dimensions and that's why the demons are coming into the overworld. So she tells him not to do that until they get to Palm City. And they do get to Palm City, and as they're there, like, they see people being executed, and then Odili attacks with his army and also with dragons. And then the queen's people, they also call other dragons, and the dragons fight, which is obviously very destructive. And then, then like, everyone's fighting, and they're fighting in the overworld, they're fighting in Izihogo as well, and that's just a huge fight and obviously they lose a lot of people and there was just a line that was so sad I mean as usual and it's after like one of their people died it says then Naya screams her voice filled with agony and fear broke the fugue of Tao's ending and her cries damned him they damned his failures his weaknesses and as he listened to her die a true death Tao Solarin learned that he had not been anywhere near the limits at which he could be hurt Keeping in mind that he has been being hurt his entire life. So, you know, that's fun. And that's where I'm at. Basically, like, after the fight, the gates to the city are open. So they're going to invade. And, yeah, that's where we're at. And, I mean, my feelings are still pretty much the same. Like, this book keeps destroying me completely. And I love every second of it. And, like I said, it's super sad. Especially like these last 25%, there was no like history learned, there was just pain and fight scenes. And I mean, they're in the end, they're always painful, but they are very good, very well written, and they always leave me very anxious. Because I mean, it's not like someone dies every single time there's a fight, but in a lot of them. So, you know, while they're fighting, I'm always waiting for like. Who's gonna die this time? You know, what a fun game. And yeah, that is that is where I'm at. I have less than 80 pages left and I am still loving it. And I will update again when I finish it. the book and actually in the first chapter in these last 80 pages we are following Essie's POV so like the queen's sister and since the beginning the queen whose name is Tiora by the way I don't think I have said that but since the beginning Tiora thought that her sister had just been like kidnapped by Odili and that she was there against her will but we learn following Essie's POV that she is actually the one that like she is like in charge it was her idea because she wants to be the queen she believes that she is the rightful queen and so yeah it was actually her idea and like Odili was doing it for her because apparently they're in love and so they are there like hiding while everyone else is fighting and, I mean, they lose, so Tao and his people get to where they are. And, I mean, Tao is ready to kill Odili, but then he says that he wants a duel between him and Odili. And Essie, since she wants to be the queen, she says that, because Odili was her champion, so she's saying that whoever wins the duel between the two champions 
will determine who the queen is. So if Tau wins, Siora will be the queen, and if Odili wins, Essie will be the queen. And I mean, I just wanted Tau to win because I wanted Tau to win, so the queen thing was kind of secondary to me, even though I obviously want Siora to be the queen, not Essie. Like, the main thing I was, you know, worried about, invested in, was Tau winning. And at first, Siora isn't really down for that, she doesn't really agree, but then she ends up agreeing. So we have the duel between Tao and Odili, and Tao is just kicking his ass, and like he is absolutely destroying him. But then he stops when Essie says that she is pregnant and Odili is going to be a father. And I mean, he's not dead, but he's dying. So Essie goes to him, and I mean, he's just suffering. So she like mercy kills him. And Odile is dead, and then she goes into Easy Hogo, and she like she's not gifted, so she can't hide herself from the demons like her sister can. And I mean, sad things as usual. It said so. Ezio Mehia, the giftless, went to Easy Hogo and took from a mother too weak to do what must be done to protect her children. She stole as much power from the goddess as she could hold, and glowing like a new sun. Ezzy braved the demons one last time so that her unborn child would never have to. And then we get back to Tao's POV and he's like looking at Odili dead and he's not feeling any better. And it says Tao was limping to the pavilion and had his back to Odili when the men died. He waited to feel different. He balanced the scales and they had to count for something. But his father and Zuri were still gone and it didn't hurt less because the man responsible was dead. Instead of relief, or a sense that just it had been done, Tao felt tired, hollow, and he kept picturing the things he'd done to Odile in the circle. It made him feel sick, and Siora had borne witness to it all. So, like, he isn't feeling any better, and since he isn't feeling any better, I'm not feeling any better either. Especially because I was just, like, I wanted him to kill him, but it wasn't even Tao that killed him, and so, like, Tao is like, you know, it didn't change anything, and, uh, yeah, I feel the same. And then they learned that... Kana, that guy who was the son of the warlord, is coming for them and Tal wants to tell something to the queen and he basically tells her there is something in the mists of Izihogo, a demon but it's different, it's stronger and faster than the rest, it knows more than they do and I think it can control the others. And Sierra's like, what the fuck are you talking about? And he says that like it can, it doesn't have eyes but it can see and like he said it can control the others and like, she has no idea what that is, and I mean, I'm just wondering if that's, like, the guy, guy, god? I don't know what he was, like, Ukuf, I think that was the name, that was, like, trapped in there by the goddess. Like, is that him? I have no idea, but it's scary either way. And so, like I said, Kana is coming for them. So they make a deal with, like, that general that I said had, like, a bigger army. They make a deal with him, and... They, like, they will join their forces to fight the... I still don't know how to say their name, but, like, the natives. I think it's it might be Shayadin, but I have absolutely no idea. But, I mean, let's go with that, because why not? And, yeah, they join their forces, and then Tao fights yet another demon. So, like, there are a lot of demons being released to the world, which is, you know, obviously not a good thing. And, I mean, there is, like, a romance starting going on between Tao and the Queen, but honestly, I mean, I, I couldn't care less, really. Uh, and then they are, like, getting ready to wait for Kana and to fight, and a shaman of the Shayadin approaches Tao and the Queen and, like, the Queen's handmaids, I think. Anyway, and he is saying that he wants to make a deal with them, basically, and that he wants them to kill Kana, because Kana is just focused on revenge, and actually they need to work together, and they need to work together to fight their common enemy. And then he says that there has been someone who got, like, to their lands, and has, like, that those people are not looking for the Shayadin, but when they find them and see that they do have, like, the gifts from the goddess, they kill them anyway, and they are like silver-skinned people, and we learn from the book, like book one, that the Kull are silver-skinned people, so like the Kull are back, and they are here to 
find the Omehi people and kill them. So that's fun. And that is how the book ended. So let's just go into my final thoughts. Okay, so just starting off with the characters, because that's what I always do. I just love Tao so much. And I was just so invested in his storyline the whole time. And I mean, I love everyone. And with everyone, I mean like the lessers and Kellen and Siora. Everyone else I hate, but I mean like that amount of people that I love is more than usual, I would say. And I mean, I have said this before, but there are just so many wholesome, cute, adorable moments with Tao and his sword brothers. And especially like in a book that is as like brutal and violent as this one, it just, they seem even more adorable. And I just love them and their friendship, their brotherhood. So fucking much. And Siora as well, like I said, I really like her. I mean, I couldn't care less about their romance, like I said, because I just don't care about romance in general, but I do like her. And I mean, I it's not like I dislike their relationship, their romance, I just don't care. And I mean, I do like their interactions, their friendship, like the way they work together. I do like to see them together. And I mean, I love how much we learned in this book. Because, I mean, we learned, obviously, like, the basics of how the world worked in book one, but it was just a lot of information at once, and it was just a little overwhelming, so I was very confused still, and I think this one, like, clarified a lot of things, and I think I understand kind of what's going on, and yeah, I really like the history lessons we got from the queen, they were very interesting. And so I really loved the world building we got in this. And I mean, in this book, we, I mean, we finished the like chapter of Tao's personal revenge on Odili because he's dead. And when I say like, it was not satisfying, it's like, it wasn't satisfying in a way of like my personal feelings that like, I wanted to feel like it changed something like Tao said, but it, I didn't, and I mean, I say that it wasn't satisfying in that sense, not in terms of like the book, like not being good, like it was, it was great. And I mean, I do like that he felt that way and it made me feel that way. Cause I mean, we knew it wasn't really gonna change anything. I mean, his dad was still gonna be dead. Zuri was still gonna be dead. It wasn't really gonna change anything. And so, I mean, I like that it felt that way. And I feel like now we are moving into something you know, much bigger, which is the fight with the Shayadin, or in this case, just Kana specifically, I suppose, and they're, they're gonna join forces and fight the Kull, which is probably gonna be epic, because, I mean, all the fight scenes in the series are epic, and they are so well done, and I just get so excited and nervous in every single one, and they also make the book feel so fast-paced, and I mean, for me, the pacing was perfect because there wasn't a single second where I was bored and I feel like there was a lot happening. I definitely felt like it was there was more happening in this one than in the previous one because in the first book, there was like a whole middle section that was like, okay, this is a lot of the same thing, the same type of fight for the same goal. And in this one, I felt like it just moved, like actually moved faster and there was a lot more things happening. And I mean, it definitely really destroyed me emotionally, which I mean, what else can I ask for? I absolutely love that. And when I was around halfway through, I said that it was like four stars from the beginning. But after like the second half, it definitely got even better and more exciting. And I was wondering whether to give it 4.5 or five stars. But I mean, there was nothing that I didn't like. There was not a moment that I wasn't like super immersed and having fun and just excited and intrigued and invested. And so, I mean, I, I love this book so much and I am giving it five stars. And I can't believe that like this book just ended with them, like basically the co finding them and there is no third book yet. I don't think it even has a release date. And I mean, how can I not just go into book three right now? Cause like I need it. And I mean, this author also doesn't have any other books I think. And I mean, how am I gonna survive this, you know? But anyway, I will be anxiously waiting for book three to be released. 
and yeah absolutely loved this book and so yeah that is everything for this week's video i really hope you enjoyed it and if you did give it a like and subscribe and i will talk to you next time bye